Hello, it's Bruce Williams, and today I want to present part two of my series on the selected gross pathology of the endocrine system. And we're going to talk about our friend, the thyroid gland. But before we do that, I want to thank all of my friends and colleagues who have provided me images over the years, either directly or through online collections, especially Dr. Don Mutin, who's provided a lot of great lectures for the foundation over the years, as well as images for this lecture, and also pretty much everything I know about gross pathology of the endocrine system. As we said before, when we talk about the endocrine system, we don't talk about a lot of infectious disease. We talk a lot about hyperplasia, hyperplasia, and neoplasia, maybe some incidental findings that I might throw in during some of these lectures. When we talk about the thyroid gland, let's start at birth, or actually before birth. It's a common problem with uh, especially production animals, cattle, small ruminants, and horses, in which a lack of iodine, either systemically, which affects the mother, or more commonly, the mother shows no clinical signs, but there's not enough to provide for the developing fetus. And so the fetal pituitary gland during development is going to act the same way that any pituitary gland is. It, as a result of a lack of thyroid hormone. It's gonna increase the amount of thyroid stimulating hormone due to a lack of feedback, and that thyroid is gonna grow. And we're gonna develop into a hyperplastic goiter. A lot of times this is dietary. The, uh, uh, there is an excess of certain types of plants, like the brassica family in the diet. That's cabbage and rape and kale and other plants which uh, produce certain types of compounds called glucosinates, which bind iodine and impair the synthesis of thyroxine. Other compounds in the diet, such as nitrates, might actually bind iodine in the GI tract, preventing its absorption. Now, as we said before, the dam may show absolutely no clinical signs of thyroid deficiency until the end of gestation. Uh, fetal hypothyroidism is often associated with dystocia, with retained placentas, and prolonged gestation. We've talked before, if gestation is prolonged, that animal is gaining more weight, becoming larger, and that predisposes to additional problems in calving. This diagnosis of congenital goiter is not a ClinPath problem. You don't need to run any tests. This is an anatomic diagnosis. Now, deficiency of iodine in the diet is only one way this can happen. Uh, interestingly enough, in the formation of goiter, too much dietary iodine may, uh, may also be a problem. Too much iodine may block the release of uh, colloid from the follicle by interfering with its proteolysis. It may block the peroxidation of iodide to iodine or the conversion of monoiodotyrosine to diiodotyrosine. So there's a number of ways. How do you get too much iodine? Well, obviously supplementation. And there are some feeds which are very high in iodine including dried seaweed. There are also some genetic uh, factors which may play. The autosomal recessive genetic enzyme defects have been seen in a number of sheep breeds, uh, Africander cattle, and dwarf goats, which predispose to uh, development of congenital goiter. These goiters can be absolutely huge in itself, contributing to dystocia. And a nice picture opened up of a colloid goiter. Some animals may not have extremely large goiters, but you will see the effects uh, in the skin. With um, They will be stillborn with a loss of hair, you may also see 
that there is a lot of edema or mixed edema within the skin all over the body. Congenital hypothyroidism in foals is associated with histologic hyperplasia of the thyroid gland, but generally not gross enlargement. These animals are born extremely weak, often do not survive, and they may have other defects in the skeletal system as a result of a failure to mineralize ossification centers, including prognathism or various or vulgar defects of the forelimbs. You can see goiter in a wide range of species, not just the ones we've talked about. You can also see it in poultry that are getting goitrogenic substances in the diet, such as rapeseed meal, as we talked about, or in pet birds who are given a lot of uh, cabbage or kale, uh, a low iodine diet. Goiter is also a problem that may be seen in fish. The thyroid in fish is sort of diffusely along the floor of the gill chamber. So to see the thyroid, you usually have to remove the gill covers. And if there's goiter, it will be very prominent, pushing up on the gill filaments themselves. You can also see ectopic thyroid tissue, which is common in, uh, in domestic species along the base of the heart. In fish, you may see ectopic thyroid tissue in a wide range of other organs, including the spleen and the kidney. Iodine is also very important in uh, thyroid health in fish and low and high iodine diets or contamination of the water, especially with pollution, will result in uh, thyroid goiter. Goiter in fish has been associated with a wide range of pollutants, including PCBs, phthalates, heavy metals, pesticides, and even certain bacterial products and poor water quality. Let's move on to uh, uh, another more common problem associated with thyroid dysfunction in dogs, and this is hypothyroidism. It's a classic face of hypothyroidism, a golden retriever with mixed edema of the face. Um, these animals generally are overweight, they may have a poor hair coat, um, and they often are fatigued. Um, they're cold a lot of the time, with the thyroid being the, the thermostat of the body. People call them heat-seeking missiles. They're all degrees of uh, thyroid atrophy, and this is a great uh, image because it makes you stop and think, are the parathyroids too big? Are we thinking about uh, dietary issues or, or renal failure? Or are the thyroids too small? Well, if you know what the normal color of a thyroid is, like most endocrine glands, it's heavily invested in blood vessels. So it should be a deep, rich, brownish red color. And this one is sort of a sick, grayish color. You can see some follicles in here. And generally, the, uh, the decrease in coloration is because we've added um, often inflammatory uh, cells, specifically lymphocytes. Lymphocytic thyroiditis is an early onset disease, which is the most common cause of hypothyroidism in the dogs. And then there's often fibrosis or fat which normally we don't see, but if we decrease the mass of follicles, we're gonna to start to see, um, see that. And also the C cells, which we almost never see, will become more prominent. So it all makes, um, thyroiditis makes the thyroid not only small, but generally discolored.
There are three basic causes of follicular atrophy in the dog. One is idiopathic, which is seen in laboratory beagles. Okay. Another one is the diminished secretion of thyroid stimulating hormones. Remember our friend pituitary neoplasm from lecture one? And we talked about the fact that when you destroy the pituitary, when you replace it with a neoplasm, you often will kill off the normal cells which are producing thyroid stimulating hormone. So this will result in a lack of TSH, a lack of stimulation to the thyroid, and thyroid follicular atrophy. Same thing will happen to the cortex of the adrenal gland as well. Wipe out the normal cells producing ACTH, no stimulation, and atrophy of the cortex. Here's a particularly profound case of thyroid follicular atrophy. Just about all that's left is there's some C-cells in here and the parathyroids. About 80% of cases of thyroid atrophy are the result of an autoimmune disease, lymphocytic thyroiditis, which results in autoimmune destruction of the thyroid gland. This is seen in a number of breeds, including Dobermans, Great Danes, Poodles, Irish Setters, Golden Retrievers, as we just saw, Miniature and Giant Schnauzers, Dachshunds, uh, Shelties, Pomeranians, Cocker Spaniels, Airedales, and something called a Hovawart, which I've never seen. Um, but there are a lot of papers out there on Hovawarts. There was an excellent case of lymphocytic thyroiditis in this year's 2018-2019 Wednesday Slide Conference, case one of uh, Conference 14. It was a combination case of lymphocytic thyroiditis and atherosclerosis. A fantastic case. Okay, so the one of the things that is very interesting about lymphocytic thyroiditis is how early this disease starts. Generally, it starts within the first couple of months of life, and some of these breeds, including the hovawort, it will be extremely advanced within the first two months of life. These animals have massive destruction of the thyroid gland even before T4 and T3 levels start to decrease. One of the test now that is available to identify this particular disease early are autoantibodies against thyroid globulin, which will be positive in affected animals at a young age. The reason that, that you ha can have normal uh, thyroid hormone in these animals is even at advanced stages there are still some follicles left and these are large and they are hyperfunctioning and they may go to maintain T3 and T4 levels and TSH levels may be normal even in advanced disease so for the detection in one of these breeds of lymphocytic thyroiditis the test of choice early on is TGAA or autoantibodies for thyroglobulin. Now before we get into the neoplasms, okay, so let's look at some incidental lesions in thyroid glands. And this next one was an absolutely new one on me and thanks so much to Dr. Taryn Donovan for submitting this uh, to Noah's archive. Um, and this thyroid gland in a dog is black. It almost looks like a clot, but it is the thyroid gland. And this can be the result of administration of tetracyclines, including minocycline. And it's dose related. Um, it looks like the this particular compound is metabolized to this pigment within the thyroid gland probably just due to, you know, uh, normal oxidation activities going on the thyroid gland. And so tetracycline, doxycycline, minocycline can turn your thyroid glands brown black.
another common incidental finding that you may see in the thyroid glands of dogs and cats and probably a number of other species, but I mostly com most commonly see it in dogs, are cysts. And there are two types of cysts. They're both lined by ciliated epithelium, so that's not going to help you very much. Um, if the cyst is between the thyroid and the parathyroid gland, right there in the crevice, it's known as a Kirsteiner cyst. A Kirsteiner cysts are just incidental findings. The thyroid gland is composed of the third and the fourth pharyngeal pouches coming together. And sometimes you'll have a little cyst formation where they come together. Not a big deal and doesn't ever cause any problems. Lined by ciliary epithelium, the difference between that and a thyroglossal cyst, as we see here in a, the thyroid gland of a ram, which enlarges the entire gland, is that Kirsteiner cysts don't have any thyroid tissue in the cyst wall. It's just epithelium and fibrous connective tissue. And the thyroglossal duct cysts will have thyroid remnants and follicles within the wall of the cyst. Neither of them really make that much difference. Um, you can have tumors arise from a thyroglossal cyst, very rare and very interesting tumors of which I don't have any gross pictures. But those are a couple of incidental findings. Viruses, bacteria, funguses, I don't have it because the thyroid gland, like every other endocrine gland, is highly vascularized. You can likely get a bacterial infection or something comes in hematogenously, just not something that is common at all. So with that, let's move on to the neoplasms. Here is a big mass on the side of the neck of a dog. Generally, the owners, when they see this, they will complain of a mass in the neck or respiratory distress. Sometimes these are very slow growing. Sometimes they are uh, rather large growing. Um, they may, if they are carcinomas, they may metastasize or they will, will often metastasize to uh, the lungs or the rapid growth will compress the trachea, causing the animal to exhibit pronounced dyspnea and inspiratory norm noise. A lot of times what you get is you get a cytology from, from these. They are readily available and you will get, um, these are often rather poorly cellular and a lot of people just poke them this, and they, they want to know, is this a lymph node, is this thyroid, or is this salivary gland? And what you will see if you get a decent aspirin, and always ask for a lot because they're not all that good. These cells tend to, uh, they tend to rupture fairly easily. People always press too hard on the cytology. You often will see a lot of naked nuclei and thyroid glands fall into a category that the cytologist will call naked nuclei tumors. A lot of the endocrine tumors, um, you tend to get a lot of naked nuclei within the smear. And naked nuclei generally should never be interpreted, but if you see a lot and you're thinking about uh, the possibility of an endocrine, it's sort of something that you might be able to hang your hat on. But when you are lucky, what you are going to get is you're going to get a nice spherule. If we, if this smeared out a little better, we would see a much better asness in the middle. There's some pink matrix, and one of the, in in between the cells. One of the things that's very characteristic of cytology of thyroid are these bluish green dots within the epithelium of these cells. And this is follicular pigment. It is most likely tyrosine. If you have a really high speed lab that can run a schmorls on this, you can rule out lipofusin. But, but to my eye, if I see spherules or uh, asini, something that looks like a follicle, with a pink center and these blue dots within the cytoplasm, you've struck thyroid gland. Now the problem with cytology on thyroid glands is it's not specific as to hyperplasia, adenoma, or neoplasia. Like most endocrine tumors, there's not a lot of cellular features of malignancy that show up in cytology. The cells often are the same size, even in a carcinoma. So, you know, 
a big mass in the wall or the side of the throat of a dog, um, your cytology is going to read out something like, while there is no uh, cytologic evidence of malignancy, historical data indicate that the vast majority of neoplasms in the dog, it's very species specific, in the dog are going to be malignant. The historical data actually shows um, from autopsies that about 70% are carcinomas and 30% are adenomas. And that is, that is autopsy data. And um, most of these big tumors, if, if it's clinically palpable, 90% chance that it's carcinoma. So the, most of the books say that 90% of these or 95% of these are going to be carcinoma. When you go back and you do a lot of autopsies, you'll find a pretty high incidence of little adenomas, microadenomas. They didn't cause any problem, but they're there. So I think the better number is 70% are going to be malignant. But if you can feel it, boy, that runs it up pretty high. The size of the thyroid tumor is definitively correlated with biologic behavior. Histology does not correlate, even in these ugly carcinomas. They look very bland, and you'll have the occasional big cell in there. Maybe you'll have a little bit of necrosis. Mitotic rate never is going to be high. So think about clinical features here. Did they palpate it? That's sort of preliminary that you're probably going to be dealing with a, uh, a carcinoma. Sometimes in dogs, one of the rare variants is somewhat less aggressive, um, and those are underneath the tongue. You can see thyroid tumors um, underneath the tongue, and those tend to be a little less aggressive. And that flies in the face of the rule that ectopic uh, tissue tends to be uh, more highly aggressive. There's a lot of thyroid tissue we talked about in fish, them sort of being scattered around the base of the, the gills. And you see a lot of ectopic thyroid tissue in dogs, from the tongue all the way back to the heart base. It is probably, looking at the numbers, the most common heart-based tumor. Even considering chemodectomas, um, ectopic thyroid tissue is a common uh, malignant heart-based tumor. These tumors tend to invade. Um, they invade by a number of ways. They invade locally. So this is a real nice uh, case of local invasion. They also tend to invade through the vessels. Okay, up to 60% in some studies of thyroid neoplasms of dogs had metastasis at the time of diagnosis. Okay. About 80% had metastasis at the uh, time of autopsy. And these things can get really big. Here's one at the heart base. There's a cut through the aorta. You can see how large this was. And there was a study done that said if the measurable size of the neoplasm exceeds 20 cubic centimeters, so that's an area, not a length, but an area, um, 70% of those animals already had metastasis. So a couple of numbers there to sort of help you, but the take home message is, um, actually two, I got one more take home message for you. Most, the vast majority of these cases, um, about 60%, maybe that's not vast, but the majority of these cases, 60% of these are going to be euthyroid animals. Big mass, you're thinking carcinoma and they're euthyroid. Okay, that's just the way it is. About 20% are going to be hyperthyroid and about 20% are going to be hypothyroid. So even if the animal has a huge mass, usually there's no abnormality in uh, TSH uh, or T3 or T4. They're also a tumor that tends to metastasize widely. They like to go to the, to the lungs more than they like to go to lymph nodes. So they'll pop up just about anywhere. So this is one of my considerations when I see a carcinoma in multiple 
organs. Could it be a thyroid carcinoma? Okay, so let's look at proliferative lesions or neoplasia of the thyroid gland in the cat. It's a very different situation. In the cat, 98% of the neoplasms we see in the thyroid gland are benign. They're often multiple. Now you'll hear a lot of terms such as adenomatous hyperplasia. Um, I don't use that term. I prefer multiple adenomas. Um, these particular tumors do not listen to thyroid stimulating hormone. They secrete the roxin and they cause a feedback loop for the other thyroid gland and the tissue in between these adenomas because they will secrete thyroxin resulting in clinical signs of hyperthyroidism in cats. You'll get these angry looking cats that are thin. Um, they are hyperactive. This one looks a little, little, uh, little strung out here. Um, they eat all the time. They may have associated heart disease, but this is a result of, of high levels of T4. T4 is a great screening. T4 and uh, free T4 are great screening tests for hyperthyroidism in the cats because it's always up. And so what happens is you may get uh, animals with tumors on one side secreting lots of thyroxin. The feedback loop goes to the pituitary gland says, I got lots of thyroxin. I'm going to shut down TSH. So a lot of times you will see these tumors on both sides. They may be bilateral. Sometimes you'll just see them on one because the pituitary gland in the face of all this thyroxin decides it's going to shut down. You will see atrophy on the other side. You often will see atrophy of the tissue in between resulting in you know, some areas of the thyroid gland being nodular due to multiple adenomas and some being very atrophic. When you look at these cats, clinical signs are much more important than routine laboratory data. You don't see much on the routine clin path. You might have elevated levels of, of uh, pack cell volume. You might have slightly increased um, MCV. A number of these cats uh, will have elevated levels of uh, hepatic uh, uh, enzymes, including ALKFOS, ALT, and AST. Generally, as we said before, T4 will be markedly increased. It's a great screening test. Usually you don't need anything else. T3 will be up. There's not gonna be any increase on TSH stimulation. You don't need to. The tumors don't listen to, uh, to thyroid stimulating hormone. They're just gonna continue to produce their high level. There won't be any spike after that. The cause of these tumors, well, there are a number of theories and possibly they are multifactorial. Um, port mutations in, uh, in these cells, including CRAS, will result in the formation of neoplasms. Um, some of these animals will have increased levels of, of autoantibodies to TSH, which will sit on and stimulate the TSH receptors. There's also, um, they've documented some tumors, abnormal proteins, which uh, mediate TSH receptor signaling, turning it to on all the time. A lot of these cats, for unknown reasons, also will have uh, hyperplasia of the parathyroids. Um, about 75% of hyperthyroid cats have a concomitant level of hyperparathyroidism. Cause is not absolutely known. Could be due to their polyphagia and their increased intake of phosphorus in the diet. A concomitant renal failure uh, could be a possibility. A lot of these cats are older. They're 10 to 14 years of age when they develop this, so their kidneys are already um, having trouble excreting phosphorus. Histologically, these tumors compress adjacent follicles. While it may grossly resemble goiter, if you look at it under the microscope, 
the follicular hyperplasia in goiter doesn't compress the adjacent follicle. Horses, especially older horses, develop a lot of thyroid neoplasms. They may be single, they may be multiple, um, and whereas a lot of the older textbooks before the advent of immunohistochemistry said that these are all follicular adenomas, and histologically they do often look like follicular adenomas. The advent of immunohistochemistry has shown that an equal number or perhaps the majority may be C-cell tumors, and I find them very confusing under the microscope. They're almost always benign, no matter which one they are. Carcinomas are very rare. So remember when you're dealing with uh, thyroid tumors in horses, here's a big one that only a little strip of normal thyroid remaining. These are generally asymptomatic. These animals are not youth. They're, they are euthyroid. They're not hyperthyroid. They're not hypothyroid. Um, but immunohistochemistry, if you want the absolute right diagnosis here, is going to be a requirement. Um, to diagnose follicular adenomas from C-cell tumors. When we talk about cattle, tumors of the thyroid gland are usually C-cell tumors. Occasionally you will see carcinomas. A lot of these have been referred to over the years as medullary carcinomas. I like the term C-cell carcinoma better, better, especially if there is metastasis. Once again, I'm very hesitant to diagnose uh, carcinomas based on cellular features. Metastasis is the be-all and end-all for endocrine tumors um, when you want to dis decide between adenoma and carcinoma. Um, the C-cell tumors are, are part of, in many cases in the bull, a syndrome of multiple endocrine neoplasms. There are many different types in people. We see them in a number of animal species. Cattle, especially bulls, um, are probably one of the best that is, have been uh, uh, linked to multiple endocrine syndromes in man. Usually you will see neoplasms also in the adrenal gland, particularly in the medulla. So pheochromocytomas, C-cell tumors, and pituitary tumors are a common combination from multiple endocrine neoplasms in animal species. We are almost done. I don't want to leave uh, out the, uh, the neoplasms in laboratory species. You can see them in all species. When we look at them in, uh, in mice, generally these are transgenic mice. Um, you can knock out the, uh, um, the genes, certain genes, and, and cause this particular neoplasm. The, the most commonly used transgenic mouse is the RET PTC1 transgenic mouse for the development of papillary thyroid carcinomas, which also happen to be the most common type of thyroid uh, tumor in humans. Um, there are numerous mouse models available for generating various models of, uh, of thyroid adenoma and carcinoma. There are also models in rats. Here is one in uh, uh, a THADA, a thyroid adenoma associated line of rat. They may also be uh, they may also be induced by the use of simvastatin in rats, as well as localized radiation. So there's a number of animal models in rat species as well. These are probably going to fade as more and more transgenic mouse models are developed for thyroid cancer. Um, rats are another species that do have a number of uh, uh, syndromes of multiple endocrine neoplasia. Um, and it could be any of the ones we've mentioned the C cells, they also will throw follicular adenomas as part, as well as adenomas of the pituitary gland, the pheochromocytomas, a very 
common neoplasm we'll speak about in rats in a later lecture, and islet cell neoplasms, or neoplasms of the beta cells of the uh, pancreatic islets. So many different types of multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome, and rats uh, do it very well. Okay, well that covers the thyroid gland pretty well. Appreciate you hanging in with me for the last half hour. I look forward to our next lecture. It's going to be a short one. Those are the ones I really like when I can get in and out in like five or ten minutes because we're going to talk about the parathyroid gland. If we want to talk about uh, all the ClinPath, that would, uh, that would be a long lecture, but that's not my area of expertise. We're going to talk about anatomic uh, abnormalities of the parathyroid gland and there aren't a lot of them. So I look forward to uh, seeing you for that lecture and I hope everyone has a great day.